Well, everyone, we're so excited that you've joined us this Mother's Day morning. It's a beautiful Sunday, and we're excited about what God would have for us today. Well, Mother's Day, this time in which we all used to dress up, show up to church with our moms, and here we are in the living room, probably on our pajamas, chilling out. Uh, Or I don't know. Who knows where you are right now? But I remember Mother's Day as this time when I got all dressed up, My sisters would be in their dresses, and I would be in my suit, really not really, but dressed up clothes back then. And uh, I hated it. My mom always made me dress up. But I ought to say something. I really miss seeing you guys. I miss seeing all the beautiful dresses, all the fine-looking men. And I'm telling you what, I can't wait till we're all together again. But as you know, we're going through this series. We're looking at these encounters that Jesus had with different people after the resurrection. And we've really looked at the first three, which were just with the disciples. This idea that he showed up uh, the day uh, uh, after his resurrection, the evening of his resurrection with the disciples. And, and he kind of helped them with their struggle with fear. And, and he was telling them that, hey, listen, it's not, you, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I want you to have hope. I want you to understand that there's peace and you can find that in me. And then we saw how he then talked to Thomas and and how he talked to him and said, hey, listen, don't doubt what, what these disciples are saying. I am risen. And he addressed our doubt. And we have doubt all the time. And then last week we dealt with uncertainty. What it's like to be uncertain, to not really know what God would have for us. And, and we kind of had that illustration uh, about Peter and on the, on the sea and what it must have been like for him to be comfortable to go back to what he was used to because he was uncertain in his life. And, and I hope that you grasp that message and, and internalize it as we, as we go about your, our lives thinking about we don't want to be uncertain. We want to be fully committed to what Christ would have for us. But today it's Mother's Day. And so we're going to go back to the very first encounter that Christ had on earth after his resurrection. I mean, when we think about that, this this time is a little unexpected. Uh, The writers really did open themselves up by sharing the actual truth because politically this was probably not a great story to tell. But it was this, this time of unexpected. This was a personal encounter with, with someone in Jesus. It was a, a very touching and moving moment. It, it was something that revealed a character that Jesus has, a, a character that God has, this tenderness that he has w- within him. Notice that it wasn't to his best friend, John. He didn't reveal himself to his best friend. He didn't reveal himself to his best leader, Peter. He didn't reveal himself to his mother. He didn't reveal himself to his brothers. No, he reveals himself to Mary, to Mary Magdalene. Now think about that. Who is Mary Magdalene and what is the significance of her life? And why would Jesus have chosen her to be the one to reveal himself Two, it's really important that we understand that. And I believe today, as we have just a little bit of time to encounter this story of Mary Magdalene, we're going to find these six really interesting character qualities, these things that happen in her life that I believe will draw us to a conclusion of why Jesus chose her. But in doing so, I brought my wife to kind of answer some questions and how we respond or how ladies can respond in times of crisis or how ladies can respond like Mary Magdalene did to kind of bring it to a Mother's Day message. So guys, if you're watching, I'm glad you are and you're going to learn something from this. But I really today want to encourage our ladies. I really want to talk to our ladies today and how they can be touched by God, that they can be used by God in a special way. You see, I think Mary is going to demonstrate her saving faith and she's going to demonstrate this support that she has for the ministry of Christ and how she is faithful to constantly serve and, and how she responds to serving Jesus and how she shares this incredible good news, these, these, S, these words that start with S, this idea that God has something for her, and I hope that you will get something out of it today. So let's start right here in the beginning. What is it about Mary Magdalene, this idea of her saving, her her transformation from lost 
to save, this time when she was, wasn't a believer and then she becomes this devoted follower of Christ. It's found in Luke chapter 8. This is where we learn the first part about who Mary is. And it says this in Luke 8 and chapter 1. It says, soon afterwards... He, Jesus, went on through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the 12 were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene. Now notice we call her Mary Magdalene, but they actually called her Magdalene. It was where she was from, and from whom seven demons had gone out. So think about her salvation message. Think about her salvation experience. It, it is coming from being demon possessed to being clean, cleansed of those demons and becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Now, most people in the world, when they think of what it means to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus, their response would be salvation is about a personal relationship with Christ. And it is. It is, but we're going to see in Mary's life how her salvation experience, this, this dedication, this commitment to Christ transforms her in thinking about others instead of herself. And so as we do so, I just want to get a woman's perspective on what it means to understand that your salvation, it impacts so many different people more than yourself. So honey, as encouragement to ladies, uh, I was in a ask you this question, why is it that we, or as ladies, can realize that their, uh, their decision to follow Christ impacts so many more people than just their own personal life? You're right, it, it does. Um, and I think probably one of the things I think about most about being a Christ follower is being a Christ follower gives you direction. And by that, I'm, I'm going to read from Malachi um, because I go back to being a young mom and we said, how are we going to raise our children and what is our objective? And in Malachi 2.15, it says, didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So as a Christian mom, all of a sudden, I have a clear mission. I have a clear direction of what God wants. Yep. And we said, we are going to parent with the end in mind. And that is, wow, godly children, what's it going to take to achieve that? Um, and so we, knowing that that was our final goal, we made daily decisions based on this. Is this going to help us have godly children? When they walk out of our door, will they know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Uh, will they all the things that we have taught them, will they be their convictions versus just, um, well, yeah, mom and dad did it, but you know, I'm going to go do my own thing. So I think it's very important for us as Christian moms to realize we have a very clear purpose and direction. And every day we can make decisions with our children to reach that end goal. Well, I, I totally agree. And I think that mothers don't understand the magnitude of their role in their salvation, how it impacts generation after generation and a generation. And I think Mary did. I think Mary found herself realizing that her commitment to Christ was going to impact all the people around her. And I think that's why she was so dedicated to follow Jesus. But it doesn't just end with this salvation experience. She also became this incredible supporter of the ministry. I mean, oftentimes women get so involved in the family that they forget that their real calling is to serve Jesus. And, and so I think that as we look at Mary's life, not only did she have this salvation experience where she understood it was about others, but it was also about serving Jesus. She was incredible at supporting the work of the ministry. Notice what it says in 8.2. Let's read it again. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, uh, and Joanna, his wife of Shuaz, Jared, uh, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others. Now notice what they, these ladies did. Who provided for them out of their means. In other words, in this journey that Jesus found himself on, these ladies were his support staff. They were disciples. They were followers. They were lovers of him. And they did the small things. They were supporting him financially. They were supporting him as he, as he went throughout the communities, sharing the gospel and telling people that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. This is an incredible story. 
We think of Mary this way. Mary was this woman who was part of this group of ladies. She was a supporter of Jesus. She supported him with her time and her talent and her treasure. And listen, it's obvious, honey, that Mary was blessed by Jesus because of this, this commitment that she had. And and so how can ladies look at their lives today and really see how they can make an impact for Jesus in the ministry? When you think about serving we, we serve in our home. We try to support our husbands um, if you're married. Um, we maybe have children. Uh, we serve at church. Those things, in essence, we don't think of those strengthening us uh, like the strength that Mary found, but they do give strength. And the best way I can explain it is God's ways are not our ways. And so um, I, I refer to Titus, um, and it's Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. And it says, Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and to train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husband, that the word of God may not be reviled. So that we don't bring shame. So first of all, we get strength when we do things God's way. We have energy and stamina to do what God has called us to do because God says, I'd like you to do it this way. I know that that's not popular. It really isn't. Um, I remember when I stepped out of the workplace, um, it's culture really values a woman who is climbing the corporate ladder, making a name for herself, breaking out of the stereotypical mold and doing it her way. Um, I struggled with it. It didn't seem like there was value to staying home and taking care of the children. And I'm not saying that you have to be a stay-at-home mom. What I am saying is you have to prioritize your life the way God has said he wants you to live. And I believe that's what Mary did. She wanted to follow Christ and give her means and do what would benefit the ministry of Christ. And when we as women desire to do what will benefit the ministry of Christ, when we desire to rear our children in a godly means, when we desire to support the people in our home, whether it's a husband or family members, we are doing what God has called us to do, and that gives us energy and stamina to do what really you wouldn't think a woman would be able to do. Well, there's no question that Mary was an incredible supporter. She, she is seen throughout Scripture doing this, these kinds of things. But that takes us to her third quality, this idea of this incredible faithfulness through suffering. We often think of times when women just are hurting and crying and mourning for what they see in the world. In other words, they see the, the heartbreak, and yet they have this incredible emotional sensitivity to this kind of stuff. And we see that in Mary's life. It, she is one of these that is all in with Jesus, and she is suffering along with him as he's going through so much in his ministry. Notice John chapter 19 and verse 25. It says this, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Notice that she was right there in the midst of these ladies, right there while Jesus was suffering, right there where the men may have been running, they may have been fleeing, but where is Mary? Mary is right there at the feet of Jesus. She's not hiding. She's not running. She's present. Matter of fact, she's witnessing the very death of Jesus that most of the disciples did not even see. This is what makes Mary so special, this ability for her to endure the suffering of Jesus and still be present in doing so. Although her world is upside down, sometimes we, we forget that she herself thought that Jesus was going to be the Messiah. We her, her, ourselves, we, we forget that Jesus, or that she thought Jesus was going to be the king of kings. She was, she, he was going to rule and reign. She was going to be part of all of that. And here he's dying on the cross. This had to be a hopeless feeling, and yet she is right there. She stays faithful through it all. Honey, when I think about that, I, I think about how women struggle sometimes when they're just in the middle of suffering. And we see Mary and how she handles it and how she's right there and she's engaged in Jesus. But it's so hard nowadays to see ladies struggling 
as they're going through a trial. They're in the midst of a battle. How can you encourage, what would we say to them that just said, listen, you can make this? One of the things I think about when you were talking is um, we both, men and women, are made in the image of God. And I think of you as the warrior type side of God and a woman, myself, um, being that tender, compassionate. I truly believe when I am hurting, God is hurting deeply. Um, he's my father. So um, I, I think of that, and I think of the times when women are hurting. Um, maybe a child is going wayward. Mm. Maybe um, a relationship is coming to an end. Maybe a job isn't going like you thought, or maybe there's a health crisis in your family. Um, I'm not saying men don't hurt, but I feel like we hurt to a different level. And God consoles us. God is there for us in ways that are unexplainable, truly. But um, I think of times, babe, when you and I have gone through tough times, and there wasn't really anything that you could say that was going to help me, and friends would want to help. But ultimately, I just had to go to God's Word. And so I think my biggest encouragement for women is when you are hurting and when you are in the midst of it, when you think of Mary she is watching Christ being crucified. So whatever struggle you are going through that you just don't know what the outcome is going to be, I can say what I had to do, and that is I literally had to open up my Bible, and I started in the book of Psalms, and I started writing just verse after verse after verse because I knew what I wanted, but I really wanted what God wanted in that situation, and I didn't know how to pray without it being my will. So I thought, you know what? If I just will write God's word, I know that he is going to answer it the way he wants to. So when a woman is going through something, that's probably one of my biggest encouragement. Go to God's word, write it out. Um, your prayer by writing his word is what he wants because it's his word. The other thing I did was um, I fasted. I can think of one of the situations that we were in and I just committed and I literally wrote in my journal, every single Monday, the date that I was going to fast mm. until we had the answer. And um, so I think that's my best encouragement when a woman is going through a tough time, when she's in the midst of the battle, go to God's word, write his word, his word is his will, and you know that your prayer then is in line with what he wants. I think one of the things you really shared there that I think is important, and I think that men feel hopeless sometimes, but we... When women realize that we don't have all the answers, I know we act like we do. I know we think we do, but there are so many times in our relationship where I just, I, I have nothing to say. I, I cannot solve your problem for you. And I think that when you turn to Christ, when you go to the word of God and you start writing it down, it really, really brings a peace and a calmness in your life. And uh, I think that's really, really, really important. Absolutely wonderful stuff. Well, when we think about Mary, and we're, we're, we're right there, and, and she's in the midst of this suffering I, concept, and she doesn't know what to do, and, but yet she's present. She's, she's right there in the middle of it. What's, what's incredible is, is the next thing that she does, this, this quality of relentless service. In other words, she doesn't let the circumstances or the event get in her way. She doesn't let the, the death of Jesus somehow stop her from loving him and caring for him and desiring to be part of what's happening around him. Notice what she does here in Mark uh, chapter 16 and verse 1. I want to just read this to you. It says this, when Sabbath was passed, in other words, after the Sabbath had passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they may go and anoint him. In other words, after she has witnessed this death, after her world has been turned upside down, she still, after all of that, takes the time and says, listen, it's not finished Yet my work is not done. I still have more to give to Jesus. And so she finds herself here early in the morning going to the tomb to put the spices on the body of Jesus. What incredible, powerful story. You know, honey, when we think about the, the, this heart of Jesus, we think about her going through this time. And, and we think about ladies today. And how, you know, they may have just gone through a divorce and it's over. And, or maybe they're in a, they were in a custody battle and, and they've lost. And now they have to deal with the judge's decision. Or maybe they've lost their job or their finances have gone away. How can, we, how can, how can you encourage women as 
They have to regroup and they have to start over. I mean, that's where Mary found herself. Is, what do I do? How do I respond to this? How would you, what would you encourage them in? We have two re- responses. One, we can cling to God um, and know that he is with us. Or we can curse God and say, you know what? It didn't turn out like I wanted it to turn out, Lord, so I'm done with you. Um, so I just think that, that initial, what are you going to do? What is going to be your response? Cling to him or curse him? Um, if you choose to cling to God, and if you have gone through that struggle, like I mentioned to you, like, Lord, I don't know what your will is in this, but I want your will. And so I'm just going to focus my prayers on you. When everything was over and the final verdict came out and the situations unfolded like they were going to unfold for us, I knew that it was what God wanted Mm. because I had prayed for it. I had committed it to him. I had prayed his word to him. And now this is what it was going to be. And I found incredible comfort in knowing that, okay, God, here we are, and this is what you wanted, even though it wasn't what I thought. But I can tell you this, babe, in every circumstance, God's word was true because Romans 8 says, 828 says, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And so the outcome, whether for a woman who she didn't want a divorce, she thought she wanted a job that, you know, was going to go this way. Um, She wanted this health situation to work out a certain way. Whatever it is, God said he's going to work everything out. And we can trust that. And I know that without a doubt, every single time God's word was true for me and it always worked out better than I could have ever imagined. I think that's one of the most difficult things is is just that total faith that what is going to happen is the will of God. And no doubt in this story, I mean, Jesus knew the will. He knew the will of the Father and he was part of it. And for Mary to just be right there willing to serve, even though she didn't understand what was happening, uh, is incredible. Yeah, he had died. Yeah. I mean, and she was still like, I will serve to the end. Absolutely. And that brings us to this four or fifth, the fifth time in her life where she has this encounter with Jesus. And that's the blessing, this unbelievable blessing, this idea of seeing the risen Lord. I want you to just think about that for a moment. Think about what it means to see the risen Lord. I don't know about you, but when I think about seeing God or being the one who saw Jesus first, I think she was incredibly blessed. I mean, she was an active, important role in the life of Jesus. And ladies, I want you to know something. You play such an incredible part here in our church. I mean, this is what God has called you to do, to be a great mother, a great wife, a great lady who supports and serves the ministry of Jesus. And her reward is played out right here at this time. Though through her salvation, through her support, through her suffering, through her service, Jesus remains faithful to her, displaying his love for her in a way that culturally was just unheard of. Let's just face it, right here, this is where Jesus breaks the culture mode. I mean, he introduces himself. He makes a woman the first witness of who he is. Listen, in that culture, if a woman would have said, hey, I've seen Jesus, it would have been ignored. It would have been absolutely irrelevant. In other words, it would have meant nothing. And yet Jesus finds himself, uh, Jesus finds himself revealing himself to her as this time to really set a different tone in culture where women are seen differently from now on, truly in the culture of the, of the believer. And I'm excited about that. So if you have your Bible, let's turn to John chapter 20. Let's read this story and this incredible emotion that Mary has here. It's found in verse 11, John chapter 20 and verse 11, it says this, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And she, as she wept, she swooped, And looked inside the tomb. So here she is crying. She sees the empty tomb. The disciples have already left because Peter and John have looked inside and then gone away. She sticks around. She looks inside. And she sees two angels in white sitting there with with where the body of Jesus had been laying. And one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? 
And she says to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. She does not even recognize that they are angels. She, she doesn't even see that at this time. She is, she's right there, and she's weeping, and she's sorrowful. And having said this, she turns around, again, without noticing that they're angels, and she says, and, I, and she saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was him. In other words, she was so overwhelmed with sorrow, she didn't even recognize the angel. She doesn't recognize Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to her, him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Wow. In the midst of her mourning and this sorrow where she doesn't even see the angels, she doesn't even recognize Jesus, she is still has a heart of service, this, this emotional attachment to doing the work that she had been set out to do. This is incredible to think of. And then Jesus says to her this. He doesn't say Magdalene. He says Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher, and she falls to his feet. So think about this, Mary, this character quality of her. She is finding herself here face to face with Jesus. She falls to her feet. And then I just immediately think at that moment, what would it be like? And we talked about this in, in, in the weeks before. What would it be like for us to respond to how we see Jesus. In other words, what would it be like for us to live like we have just seen Jesus? And honey, I think about ladies and again, like their lives are so busy. And what should a woman do? How is it that she can really portray herself as though she's just seen Jesus and make an impact for him in the kingdom? Like Mary, missing the fact that it was Jesus right there. I think a lot of times we are busy and we don't recognize when we have had an encounter with Christ. Um, so I have to say that I read a book years ago, um, and it was called The God Moment Principle. And the author, um, Mr. Wright, says that there are five God moments to watch for. And so I wrote them down because I do want to share them briefly. Um, one is an amazing rescue, a moment when God guarded you, healed you, rescued you, and made a way out. So look for those moments. Or what about a holy attraction, a moment when God led you toward a healthier path, a time of purity, taking a more virtuous route, um, an unearned blessing, a moment when God gave you an unexpe unexpected blessing or an undeserved gift. Another time would be revealed truth, a moment when God revealed truth through um, his word, maybe a message, um, wise counsel, or even an inner peace that he gave you about something. And then valuable adversity, a moment when God, through a tough time, um, made you stronger, uh, stronger as you came out of it. So you take those times and you start asking God, when, when did I have that? And I definitely could think of moments when that was true in my life where he brought me through an amazing rescue um, or valuable adversity. And I started journaling those. What that did for me, honey, was made me realize I encounter Jesus a lot. Mm. And as I encounter him, one, I can recognize it more quickly. I can be more grateful and see how I can use that story, that time, to encourage another woman. Um, listen, this is how God was faithful in my life through this circumstance. Let me share it with you and encourage you in that way. So I've realized that we have a lot more God encounters, Jesus encounters, than we actually realize. But I've slowly begun to train myself to look for those, to write them down, be grateful for them, and then share them with somebody. That's good. That's good advice. I believe that we do. I think that, like Mary, we have a lot of encounters with Jesus, and, and how we respond is so important. It's absolutely, it's incredible. And so we look at Mary and what she does next, which is really the truth of the story. And, and she responds in this incredible obedience. I mean, she hits her knees, and she is at the feet of Jesus, and then Jesus begins to speak with her. And I, I think that we oftentimes, we kind of miss the moment when we have these Jesus encounters. 
You, we don't take time to really worship God and thank him for what he's done. We, we kind of just skip him and go to the next thing. And here Mary, she, doesn't, she takes full advantage of the situation. Notice what she does in verse 17. It says this, And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Now think about his resp her response. Her response was immediately, I'm going to worship God. Jesus speaks to her through her in in encouragement or in that moment. And think about how ladies go through these moments and they, they hear from God. And then she immediately obeys what does she do? She's the first evangelist. She runs back to the disciples to tell them that she has seen the risen Lord. Now listen, we're living in a world where the world says, ladies, what really makes you valuable is empowerment, being the leader, being the dominant one, being like a man, being out in the workforce. I'm here to tell you something. This is this is exciting because Jesus lets ladies know, lets all of us know, hey, the most important thing is not chasing all of those things. The most important thing that you can do is to, pro to proclaim the truth about me, the good news, the gospel. The most important thing you can do is be obedient to my word. Sometimes, honey, I think that ladies... Uh, feel like they're so overwhelmed with life. They're so busy. They're so consumed with everything that's going on. A lot of times they go through these God moments and they don't even have time to really process it. And certainly they don't feel like they have time to share the gospel with others. What would you say to encourage them to find ways to be able to share the gospel in their incredible busy lives? Well, first of all, um, every day with our families in our homes, if you are a mom who stays at home, um, if you are a woman who goes out in the workplace, every day we have the opportunity to live like God has called us to live, to love others, um, to share the gospel through our actions, through our compassion, through our love, um, and in the workplace at times when it's appropriate through words. Um, sometimes it is just actions, but certainly in our homes. And I think we don't maybe put enough importance on the fact that even in our own homes with the people who are around us every day, coworkers, um, neighbors, that we can share the gospel how, through how we live and, um, and how we talk to others. But I don't know if you remember this. Um, when we were in the youth group, you had said one time, when you are fearful of sharing the gospel, stop and think, what blessing am I going to miss out on if I don't share? And I try to do that when I'm out and God is tugging at my heart to witness to somebody. First of all, I know that fear is of Satan, but the next I think, what is the blessing I'm going to miss out on if I don't share? And that has really transformed how I can share the gospel. Um, I want to be a part of a blessing. And I can't tell you how many times I have been blessed um, by the fact that I did take that moment and share. And right now during COVID-19, I haven't been out a lot, but when I have been in the store, I have really tried to take advantage of just to take a moment and look at the person and say, how are you doing during mm. all of this? And people are really hurting and they're yeah. very fearful. Um, so it has given me a great segue into saying, you know, I don't know if you know where you will spend eternity, but I just want to say that during this time, Jesus is the hope that we have. And either give them a tract or, you know, give a few minutes to just, um, just give them a hope that Jesus is their hope. Um, so I think in the busyness of life, every day we can live our lives in such a way that we are teaching the next generation about Jesus but also we can choose to see the blessing of sharing our faith, just like Mary did. She, yeah. she rushed to share her faith. I think we don't realize the blessing of sharing our faith because when we think of not only the person we're sharing our faith with, but even the blessing that we receive by making God happy, by, by being obedient. In other words, it's not, we don't realize that God is really full of joy when we are sharing the gospel. Well, and I think the next thing, too, is the future generations. Yeah. The future generations that benefit. If this person right here chooses Jesus Christ and says, yes, I am going to follow him, that person then affects future generations. And Man. that has a lot of value. When we think about that impacting the next generation, I think that's so critical. And that's exactly why we're here today. That's why we're here and we want to share the gospel with you. 
We know that the Bible says this, that Jesus loved you so much that he died on a cross for you and for me. And, and he lived a sinless life and he raised from the dead after this crucifixion three days later to show that he had the power to overcome death and sin. It's an incredible true story that oftentimes we look right over because we don't understand the importance of it. So if you're listening or you're watching us today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, we want to encourage you to do so. We want to let you know that the Bible says, listen, if we would confess with our mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in our heart that he's risen from the dead, that we'll be saved. In other words, we'll have a relationship with him. We will live with him forever. We will avoid that awful place called hell. And it just takes a repentance of our heart. It takes a transformation of our heart, a desire to follow him. And if you'd like to do that today, I'd love to lead you in just a short prayer that the prayer doesn't save you. It just gives you the words to say. It would be something like this, dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask you to save me. I repent of my sins and I, I turn to you, Jesus. Lord, I believe in my heart that you have risen from the dead. I, I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. You are the God, the creator of the universe. And I'm going to place my trust and my faith in you. We would encourage you to pray a prayer, something like that, because I believe that if you give your life to Jesus, your life will never be the same. It will be impactful, just like Mary Magdalene's life was. So let's pray together as we close this service. We want to thank you, Crystal. I want to thank you, honey, for showing up and doing this awkward situation. But let's ask God to bless this time together. Father, we just thank you for our ladies. We thank you and we just lift them up to you this Mother's Day. Lord, we know that you love them, you care for them, even where they find themselves struggling or in doubt or in fear or wherever they may be, Lord, we know that you love them and you care for them. And Lord, they just, they just need to be encouraged to stay faithful, to, to stay committed to what you have for them as a mother, as a wife, as a, as a coworker, whatever that may look like. Lord, we just want to bring them and lift them up to you today. Lord, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for dying on the cross for us and giving us salvation. Lord, if anybody is out there that has prayed that prayer, Lord, I pray that they would, they would do whatever it takes to get discipled by a local church. If that would be ours, we would love it. Father, I just pray that you would impress upon their hearts. Lord, we thank you and we lift your name on high. In Jesus' precious name, in all God's people said, amen. And amen. Hey everybody, Pastor Ron here. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Here at ABT, we make a big deal about following Jesus. Make sure that you subscribe and hit our notification bell so that you don't miss any of our upcoming video content. Also, if you'd like to support this ministry, please click donate now. Thanks for watching.